Good morning, friends, and welcome to episode 88. Am I right, Lou? Yeah, we're on episode 88. 88 for chapter 8. And <laughs> verse 8, yeah. <laughs> and we are on verse 8 through 14. So as I said to you in our last episode, chapter 8 is a short one. It only has 28 verses. And this is a new system where I just go through eight verses at a time, seven verses at a time, without going through every verse word by word. Mm -hmm. If somebody's interested in really a detailed uh, description of each word, because every word in every verse means something, and right. you can find uh, books and videos and tapes and recordings and lectures from swamis who will spend years going through each uh, chapter. So, and you can do that if you're interested. But for the average person, I think they're more interested in just a general version. And I realize that now as we're getting through to chapter 8. So in this chapter 8, verse 8 through 14, this topic is that through ever fast yoga and meditation, through doing yoga and meditation again and again and again, constantly, consistently, without fail, blocking out all other thoughts, you reach Brahman and you become self-realized. So verse 8 basically is telling us that when you want something really bad and you're just committed to that 100%, whether you be, I remember going through medical school or studying to be a doctor, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a musician, right. if you really want to achieve that goal, you have to just focus on it to the detriment of all of your other interests. You have to be focused 100% on it. And this verse, this chapter says, if you think a certain way, uh, you will become that. If you want to reach Brahman and you keep thinking on it, you're focused on it your whole life, you will become that. So it also suggests, and this is what we were talking about last time, that what is your thought at the time that you die? If your thought is on Brahman, if your thought is on God, you will get to God. But it doesn't mean that all your life you think about achieving power or fame or becoming a president or getting lots of money that you're going to just say the thought of God at the time you die and you will reach there. No. You have to be thinking of God consistently and at the time that you die, that's the thought that will come to your mind and you will reach there, not just because of the last thought, but because you've been thinking about it your whole life. But then... In order to do that, to meditate like that, to do yoga, you have to make the mind steady and calm to meditate. How? Because the mind is made up of habits. You have a habit, not just from this life, but from all your previous lives, thousands of lives. Your mind has developed habits that you can't control. It becomes very difficult to get through those habits of thinking a certain way. A person who is addicted to food is going to be thinking about food, 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 food all the time. It has to be broken out of that habit. It has to be trained. Now, we've seen people who have dogs. I've never had an animal or a pet as a dog. But when you go to some people's homes, you see that their dogs are totally out of control. Yeah. Not trained at all. Uh, one friend that we have, we go to his and her house. And the dog is jumping up at the table and wanting the food from the what everybody else is eating. And right. the host will just keep feeding the dog from their plates. And the dog is being a nuisance. Whereas I've gone to Europe more so than over here. And the dogs are come so well trained. They will sit under a chair for the entire period in a restaurant, outdoor restaurant, the dog will be very quiet, not barking, not making a sound. The smell of all kinds of food going around and the dog will not move. Mm -hmm. So that's a training of an animal. You've seen lions being trained in a circus, elephants being trained, dolphins being trained. Our mind is just like that. You can train it. That word of training in uh, Sanskrit is called abhyas. Um, in, in Marathi, uh, abhyas means study, but it also means train, to train your mind to be a certain way. And that training, you can uh, 
for for disturbance from within you so when your mind is uh, you're doing something and your mind starts to be disturbed from within right says, oh i want to get up i want to get myself a cup of coffee you can with a bias with training say no you just concentrate and it helps your concentration then there's something known as discipline and that discipline or education is called in sanskrit vairagya is the to educate the mind about how to fight the objects of the world and the world itself and the pleasures that these objects bring you so with vairagya you can dissipate you can disassociate yourself from the world the objects and the pleasures that these objects bring to you so mm-hmm. with abhyas and vairagya training and education your mind can be trained to uh, be calm to meditate and to be steady just like an animal so then you say okay well how am i going to think of god to constantly remember god you're telling me i should say god's name i should think upon him i should think of him or her it how do i do that if i don't know what god is like it's impossible to comprehend brahman right we've said right. that is hard to comprehend it's the nature of your memory your thought process if i ask you to think of something that i ask you to think of an apple immediately the thought of an apple comes to your mind and you can visualize it you can probably even smell it and you can close your eyes and think of what it tastes all of those perceptions come by because you've had apples many times in your life if i ask you to think of a place that you can actually close your eyes think of it visualize it smell it all those com- perceptions will come back if i ask you to think of something you've never been to never eaten never seen never perceived in any way you cannot bring that to your mind and that's what brahman is yeah since you've never experienced brahman and it's beyond comprehension or perception or thought or emotion or anything you cannot think of brahman right you right. cannot think of a place or an object that you've never seen or experience so when i say when the scriptures say think of god cons- constantly and consistently throughout life and you will get there you say but how i don't know what he is like so in these verses the gita tells us that god is everywhere he is being all he is we know, he knows all being all he knows all he, god is very 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 subtle now all of us refer to god as he it's just a habit that we can get out of it's easier than referring to god as an it or she because it's a force it's a power we don't know what it like the only analogy is that electricity so how can you visualize electricity i say i need to turn on the light the light comes on what does electricity look like you don't know we don't know it's inconceivable it's like the thought process the electricity that goes if i prick my finger and then the next thing is i ex- experience pain in my brain right. how quickly did that pain get go from this finger that i pricked to my brain all through the nerves in my body and all the way up here in a fraction of a second and how it's inconceivable so in this these eight pointers uh in the gita it says god is omniscient and we can look up these words ancient ageless eternal all ruler controls and rules over everything nothing happens without god having made it happen and now be careful <laughs> don't misunderstand god doesn't determine what happens to us or whatever but because of god it happens so i i lu i want to make sure that i'm clear with this yes god does not determine what happens at all but he makes things happen right in other words our karmas determine what happens good things happen because you've done good things in the past bad things happen because you've done bad things in the past god doesn't god enables these things to happen and we can talk about that more at some point if you have questions write to me we well, can talk about what that does but god didn't make that an accident happen people often say god did good things god did bad things god didn't so well, we can go to we can go to the example of electricity again because uh, electricity didn't fry your dinner it didn't display the tv 
image that you saw. It didn't turn the light on. It just supplied the power for that to happen. Very good example. Correct. So God is minuter than minute, smaller than an atom, supporter of all. Without God, the universe wouldn't exist. The cosmos wouldn't exist. The world wouldn't exist. It's in God has an inconceivable form. God is, the last two, are effulgent like the sun, meaning the sun emanates light, heat, without requirement for another body to provide that to the sun, right? Not like the moon. The moon requires, in order to shine, the sun to be there. Without the sun, the moon is dark. So the sun reflects off. The moon is not effulgent. The sun is effulgent. And the last one is beyond darkness. That's an interesting uh, point that the Gita makes. Yeah. Beyond darkness, it means really beyond ignorance. So just like you say, I know, right? I know that I know. If you ask me, do you know your two times table? Yes, I know my two times table. I know I know my two times table. Right. But I also know what I don't know, right? So if you say, can you multi, can you, do you know your 87 times tables? I say, no, I just know 87 times one is 87. That's all I know. I don't know 87 times 12. I don't know 87 times seven. I know 87 times 10 is 870, but that's all I know. Right. I don't know my 87 times table. So I know what I know. I don't, I know what I don't know. Similarly, if dark light comes from the sun, Darkness also comes from the lack of sun, but it's not purely lack of sun. There is not knowing. Just like not knowing, there is lack of light. And Brahman is beyond that. So the other question in this is the final step. At the time of death, the thoughts should be on me. This we discussed in our last episode. Similarly, it says when you have thoughts on me at the time of death, then you will reach me. We talked about this. I don't want to go into it again. If you're interested, please go back and listen to um, verse uh, episode 87. So in this point again, since it's brought up in these verses, it's like Prince Siddhartha. He was a prince. He was going to be king. His father did not want him to go towards religion. An astrologer had told him that this prince of yours is going to be one of the greatest religious uh, mm -hmm. teachers and the king said, absolutely, lock him up in the palace. Let him never leave the palace. And Prince Siddhartha escaped, went into the forest and became Buddha. So what happened? Prince Siddhartha, in essence, died. He yep. didn't die physically, but he died because he became Buddha. And he became uh, the great Buddha. So Prince Siddhartha died, Buddha was born. So and that is the death also, as we talked before. Right. So in this, the important thing to remember is this quality of life. Like when we say life, everything in these scriptures, in the Upanishads, is given scientifically. So we talk of life and you say, well, what does life look like? What kind of energy is life? We don't know, right? What the scriptures say is it is divided into five portions, minimum. One is called prana, and prana is the life force within us, also referred to sometimes as breath. So prana comes in, right. and that is prana, but also the life force within us is prana. And apana is excretion. Excretion not just of breath, but also excretion of everything else, sweat, urine, feces, earwax, all of these things get excreted. The body needs to take in certain things and excrete certain things. So prana and apana is all forms of this life force of ours. And saman, saman means equal. In the life force, neither can be excessive. You cannot excrete more than you took in, and you cannot take in so much that you don't excrete it. It has to be equal. So that's also a force within us that makes sure that whatever you take in, you give out equal. In You take in a certain amount of breath, oxygen, carbon dioxide, whatever their gases there are in the air that you breathe, you have to excrete the same amount. You take in a certain amount of food, and you will excrete that in the form of sweat, 
feces, urine, and energy, just glucose, just metabolism. The samana is equal. Next is vyana. Now, vyana refers to the circulation of all the fluids in the body, not just blood, but um, uh, lymph, lymph uh, goes through the lymphatic system, right. uh, all the other fluids, and there's many of them that the body has. It all has to be circulated. And the vyana is the life force that consistently circulates all of that. And acupuncture i went for acupuncture nothing was helping me and i finally went to a lady who was practicing acupuncture and she was well written up in the internet and right. it was amazing what she did in one session sitting with her she took away this pain that no medication no amounts of treatment was able to do and which i said how did you do that what did you do and she says it's all a matter of these forces within you and I knew exactly what she was talking about, although I didn't understand it. She said, there are forces that go from point to point in the body. Right. And those forces are misaligned or blocked at certain points. And all I do with these needles in specific points, which are not even related to the points that I was having pain in, right. she was able to correct that uh, viana. That's that force. And the last one is udana. Udana is the subtler energies within us that we don't know of consciously. So we have a subtle force such as consciousness, or, or sorry, conscience. Conscience, we have, it's called sukshma buddhi, the ability to think of things that are extraterrestrial, the things that, to think of, is this right, is this wrong? Those are different thought processes and stuff than the conscious, and that is known as udana. So 11th verse, talks of Om and how important it is to meditate on Om. Om being the um, one syllable, single syllable, a sound that is a, uh, u, m. Books have been written on the meaning of Om. And what this verse says is that if you concentrate on Om and meditate on Om, it's the same as meditating on Brahman. Mm -hmm. Verse 12 talks about controlling all gates of your body. Now, we will discuss this another time that there are 10 gates in the body. You may say, well, how 10 gates? Eyes are two, nose is one or right. two, uh, ears are two, mouth is one, and the genital organs, the uh, anus, all of this. But the two that we miss are the one that is above, the f one that we call when the child is born, the foramen, which is open, and the one in the belly button through which the umbilicus that was connected to the mother. Yeah. So there's 10 of them. And the scriptures tell us that when we die, the Atman, also when the body falls apart, the Atman leaves the body in that sense through this opening in the skull. That's mm -hmm. a whole other story that we'll call control. But it says controlling all gates. It doesn't say shutting all gates because it's very smart. It doesn't say shutting all gates. If you shut your gates, you will become frustrated in life. You can't. You can't say, I'm going to lead my life blindfolded and keeping my ears closed and not speaking. You'll go psychotic. Um, you have to be able to open your eyes, look, but don't see so much that you get confused and not being able to think or concentrate. So it says control your gates, control your five organs and senses sure. yeah. in order to meditate, uh, keeping your mind on O. And the last one is that Brahman is easily attainable by that ever steadfast yogi whose mind constantly thinks of me without any other thoughts. So uh, Brahman says, if you want to reach me, if you want to reach God, you want to become self-realized, have me consistently in your thoughts throughout your life and you will reach me. Yeah. Controlling the gates goes back to our marshmallow experiment, talking about how we control desires by understanding the stimulus we're taking in and, and controlling the stimulus we take in, correct? Yes, and that's an important ex exercise and an experiment that uh, uh, if those of you who haven't uh, uh, re read this or heard about it, uh, what Lou is talking about is very important, that at an early age, a psychologist demonstrated that 
to our very young children were given this experiment to say, you can indulge your senses right now and eat these marshmallows, or you can wait a short period of time and control your desires. And those who did, when he re-evaluated them 20 years later, the ones who were able to control their desires were much, much more successful. Right, so, and the way they did, the way the most of the children who controlled their desires to get the second mar marshmallow and wait did so by not looking at the marshmallow. That's right. right. That's right. Good point. I for, yes. So the way they did that was uh, the children, when instead of focusing on the thing where the eyes were looking at the marshmallow and the smell of the marshmallow was tempting them to get it, they just turned their heads and they looked elsewhere till the psychologist came back into the room so that they would not be succumbing to that temptation. Good point, Lou. Very so they, good point. They controlled their gates. They controlled their gates. They, yeah. Yes. Very That's good point. And we don't have to dwell into this too much, but I don't think we touch upon it enough because we talk about the goal of self-realization. We've been talking about it throughout all the episodes here, but there are many benefits along the path as well. There is a peaceful, more calmer life as you become more skilled at this. Self-realization is the goal and it's a worthy goal, but I don't want people to uh, diminish anything short of self-realization because there are many benefits to be gained there and, and many positive things to be gained. Along another another excellent point by you, Lou. I s certainly can vouch for that, that as I have become more self-disciplined, not self-realized, but becoming more self-disciplined, the benefits are tremendous, not just internally within myself, but also externally. Uh, and somebody actually wrote to me, I don't want to use the name, but wrote to me saying that, I've been listening to your episodes, listening to what the Gita tells us, and true to form, for the first time, my boss recognized what I have become and gave me a promotion and gave me a raise. Wow. So yeah. the benefits of this are tremendous. And the reason for that is simple, because as you start becoming more self-developed, your work, your relationships, everything starts to show that you are less selfish. Right. You're dealing, you're dealing from a place of peace as opposed to a place of mental disturbance. Yes. And Remember? you're not wanting for yourself. You're willing right. to give more to the corporation, the company you work for, right. for, to your boss, to your colleagues. Everything is not me, me, me. It's not transactional. You're giving more. The bosses recognize that. The world recognizes it. And you become a more likable person. You become a more successful person. You become materially much more prosperous. And the rub, Lou, is, and this is, this is, the, this is the risky part, that as you become more self-developed and you become more wealthy, things start to come to you, not just in terms of money, but also other temptation, worldly pleasures start rushing to you. And in the scriptures have described this as God, Brahman, throwing temptation in front of you to prevent you from going further. Yeah. And only those that are able to push those aside and say, I don't want this, it you can come, you can pu put the money in your bank account, but you are just going to continue to pursue self-development. Only those succeed to get to self-realization. But it's a trap. As you get to be more successful in this self-development, all these temptations will come to you, flooding to you. All right, excellent. And we have, uh, uh, we're going to a v extended or a very interesting verse in the next verse in the next episode. Oh, man. I like verse 15 the most out of the entire Gita. And the reason for that is because it talks about a scientific fact that many people, even those that talk about this uh, verse in their, in their explanations, skip over because they may not realize the scientific impact of this. Many of you won't. I probably will just talk about that one verse for half hour or an hour next All right. time. All right. I don't care if you're at work. I don't care if it's late at night. Head on over to verse 89, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've gotten here. Go right there, verse 89. I mean, to chat to episode 89. Yes. And please write to us, write to me, tell me uh, everything that you think about in terms of these verses, especially verse episode 89.